That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Alexandra. I am so excited to have you here on the new mid. Welcome. I'm happy to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm, I'm so happy that we are going to be talking about the importance of love, because if we need love in this world right now more than ever, and one thing that's exciting is your wonderful podcast, Reimagining Love, and your message that you can be whole and a work in progress at this same time really resonated me. And one of the things that, that popped for me, when you're interviewing someone, you ask your guests at the beginning of the podcast, a relational self-awareness question. So I would like to start with that question for you. Tell me, <laughs> <laughs> tell me about a growing edge you are currently working on in one of your important relationships. And what has it been teaching you lately? I love that you are flipping, <laughs> flipping the script right on me. <laughs> I think some of your friends are going to love that too. <laughs> That's so funny. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, so just let me back up for a moment. And I promise I will. I won't do the therapist thing where the therapist is like, now let me ask you, why are you asking me that question? I will not do that. <laughs> I promise I will answer, but I want to back up and just say that relational self-awareness is the through line in all of my work. So whether I'm on the podcast or in a therapy session with a couple or teaching you know, students or training therapists or sitting with my own husband of 23 plus years, I'm committed to understanding the self in the context of our most important relationships, right? I believe that relationships are teachers and that our intimate relationships are very powerful teachers, right? They give us direct lines to our past. They help us understand what remains unhealed inside of us. And so that's what I want to help people bring to their most important relationships is that growth mindset, that curiosity. So I would say, Michelle, that for me, one of my, I think that the growing edge I think the growing edge I'm working on, frankly, is a really, it's a, it's a midlife edge. Like we've begun to empty our nest. Our oldest son is away at college and our daughter is a junior in high school. And so I'm, I'm really aware of how, I don't know that I knew just how much I anchored my sense of worth in um, being needed, <laughs> being busy, you know, being sort of stretched thin and our house is different. You know, we've got only three quarters of the number of people living here. And our son who has, who is away has some pretty complicated special needs. And so that, that means that my identity as a special needs mom has been very much about being an advocate, being in the trenches, being his ally, you know, really working so hard to make sure that he has what he needs. And there's just more space, right? There's more space in my mind. There's more space in our home. And I'm, my growing edge is like how to breathe into that space, right? Like how to allow it and how to notice that it feels, it's not quite comfortable because there's part of me that's like, but wait, doesn't everybody need me? And aren't there more fires to put out? And so it, it is, I'm just noticing the, all the feelings I have about there being a bit more space, right? I love it. I feel more creative. Um, I feel like I've got a bit more time on my hands, but I'm also aware there's this other part that is like, it's not quite comfortable to, I think I have anchored my sense of self a bit more than I'm comfortable with on the idea of, of being needed. Do you think it's, I hear something and I'm not a therapist, I'm just a coach. So, or I shouldn't say just a coach, but I'm a coach and I love listening to my clients and something that really resonates with what you're saying is about the self and being so self-aware and knowing that your identity as a self needs mom. But it's interesting because I can't help but wonder, and I think my listeners would relate is that now that you have this ex more time to be a little more creative and maybe work on yourself a little bit more, that might feel a little difficult because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, Brene Brown might label it as, oh, there might be a little guilt or shame towards that because it's like, no, wait, this was another cause. And now I'm putting this reflection on myself. 
-hmm. How can you get past that? How can someone who's listening, because there are, are moms out there that are becoming empty nesters, mm -hmm. get past that? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, check back with me in a couple of years, right? <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I know, the thing that I know to be true intellectually. So here's where, you know, I get to walk my talk is that for right now, I'm just noticing, I'm just, no I'm just noticing and I'm welcoming and I'm inviting all of the shades of the experience. Like, oh, there's some grief. Okay, grief. Like, you know, let me like, let me sit next to you. Let me listen to you. Like, what is that grief about? Okay, here is some shame. Oh my gosh. Like sometimes when we, right, sometimes when we are self-reflective and we bump up against an insight. So for me, the insight is, ooh, there's a part of me that needs to be needed in order to feel worthy. That's uncomfortable for me to have that insight. So, so rather than feeling ashamed, rather than pathologizing myself, rather than panicking, I'm just with it. I'm just, I'm just sitting with it. Like, wow. Okay. There's a part of me that has relied on being needed in order to feel worthy. Huh? What, how else might I experience a sense of worthiness, right? What are my other avenues to feeling worthy? rather than scrambling to figure out some other way to feel needed, right? Rather, it's just, I think it's just, right now for me, it's about witnessing. And so much, I think so much of that midlife, so much of those midlife shifts and changes are, they're normal and they're expected. And I think sometimes when changes are normal and expected, like empty nesting, I think we can, we can fool ourselves into thinking, well, it's normal. It's expected. It's what every mom wants to have happen. So why am I feeling sad? Why am I struggling? Why am I feeling shame? So, so just stopping that like two-step, right. Of if it's normal, then I shouldn't feel sad. Right. And just being like, okay, this is normal. And I'm sad. This is normal. And there's a bit of shame and discomfort here in what I'm noticing about myself. We don't one have to, the, yeah. One of the things I love to, to talk to my clients about too, is being a scientist of your own life, Sure. not, not having any kind of judgment, but, but that awareness, you talk about that self-awareness and mm -hmm. you have written two books. You've written, um, your second book is taking sexy back, how to own your sexuality and create the relationships you want. And your first book, um, loving bravely 20 lessons of self-discovery to help you get the love you want are both fantastic books so you have been in this world of love and self-awareness for for quite a while now which is wonderful and thank you for doing that what drew you to following this work for writing these books and starting your podcasts well, it has, I mean, it has been my career, my, my entire career. So I, you know, went to college and went right from college to graduate school and um, have got my doctorate in counseling psychology. And so I, I really did start my career as a therapist and a professor and a researcher. So this has just been the world that I've been in um, for my whole career, but I have always loved I always say that I'm a woman on a bridge. I've always loved bridging the world of academia and like making academic research accessible for the general public, making clinical wisdom and clinical tools accessible for the general public. So I've, you know, when there's, I work, um, have worked for many years at a place called the Family Institute, which is uh, at Northwestern University. And whenever there's an inbound media request, I'm like, I'll do it, I'll do it. So from the very beginning of my career, I was always interested in talking to journalists, being on TV. I love, I love sort of the thrill and the challenge of figuring out how will you say something complicated, you know, in a short amount of time? How do you translate something in a way that makes sense for people? So I've always loved that that process and you know the, the study of intimate relationships the study of love is it's endless right so my career gets to take on different chapters so i did work for a while supporting families of kids with special needs i did work for a while helping college students understand dating and love and sex and so there's different facets of my career that come forward in different moments um but it's been a career that has, has suited me really well. And I continue to be challenged and engaged. And then as we were saying before, I continue to have 
lots of opportunities to look at myself and how, okay, am I walking my talk? You know, am I? <laughs> so that's my, how did you, how did you find your way into this world of coaching? Um, well, it's funny because I had a hard time becoming 50. Uh, I worked in the entertainment industry most of my life for over 20 years and we coveted 18 to 49. So when I turned 49, I got depressed. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to become invisible. And so at, I was, I turned 50 and thank God for my best friend and my, my parents, they were like, we're celebrating you and my husband and kids. But then I was at my daughter's, uh, she was nine at the time, her um, spring concert and I had a hot flash. And one of the moms looked over me and was like, oh, you're getting really emotional. And I was like, oh, don't worry. In my head, I'm like, you'll be getting emotional too soon. But it made me realize she didn't see me as a middle-aged woman. Like, what was my view? Remember the Golden Girls? You know, have you seen yeah. that going out? The Golden yes. Girls and, <laughs> and Sex in the City. And mm -hmm. I was like, we're the new mid. We're the new mm -hmm. midlife. So I, I, I decided to use my medium. So I created this podcast, talked to my friend Fred into giving me 30 minutes on a radio station and doing a podcast. And when I went to a conference, the one of the speakers uh, I was talking to, as I was telling him what I was doing to my passion, he looked at me and said, you need to be a coach. Like you need to coach midlife women. And I was like, hmm. I do. And he's like, look back on your life in 10 years. How will you feel if you've helped all these midlife women really empower themselves and live an abundant second half? And I started crying. So I started doing oh. research and studying and, and now I have a wonderful academy of these incredible women. So, but this, this interview is not about me. <laughs> See, you're a good podcaster. You ask question? <laughs> I love that. I'm, I love hearing that. What a cool, what a beautiful story. I, I love that you have um, right, found this, found this avenue and that you are, that you're finding ways to celebrate yes. all of what it means to be a midlife woman, because there is so freaking much to celebrate. My gosh, I feel wiser than I ever have. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got so much to, you know, it's just, it's such an exciting <laughs> Time. And you're right. The cultural messages around invisibility and marginalization are so strong. And I love that you are committed to being a force pushing against that. Well, I want people to realize that we're, we're just getting started. It's time to start something new. You know, we're still climbing and, and how to deal with each facet of our life, of our wealth, our health and our relationships. And that's why I'm really excited about this conversation with mm -hmm. you because we can be struggling with our, our spouses or our partners and they can, we can come up against resistance of them wanting to do the internal work that needs to get done. You know, um, and they can be like a little resistance, right. To do the relationship work. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you walk us through, um, some things that we could do to try and get our partner to that place where you can work on it? Yeah, it was, you know, when I launched Reimagining Love, so the, the structure of the show is the first episode of each month is a sort of solo episode of me talking through one aspect of relationship. And then the middle of the month is interviews and conversations with guests. And then the last episode of the month is a love story where I'm sitting with a couple or a relationship of some kind and sort of drawing forth their story. So as we're working on the editorial calendar, I knew the very first kind of solo episode that I wanted to do was about inviting a reluctant partner into relationship work, because it is the question I have gotten more than any other question mm -hmm. since Loving Bravely came out. I did not, and it was interesting. I didn't, I didn't see that coming, but that, that was the question that people asked me all the time when that book came out. It was like, I'm here for it. I'm here for the relational self-awareness. It's my boyfriend that's not. It's my husband that's not. And so it's almost always heterosexual women posing that question about their reluctant boyfriends and husbands, you know? So that, and that episode, no surprise, you know, has, has performed, has continued to perform, perform quite well, even though a bunch of episodes have come out since then. So I think your question is spot on. And I think part of it begins with how we ask the question. So it's not, how do I get my partner to do this work? Because as soon as we start thinking about getting somebody else to be some kind of way other than they are, 
we basically invite their resistance, right? We invite their defensiveness because we're saying you aren't okay as you are. And I've got some ideas about how you should be different. So it's a, it's a, it's a way that we as women so often language this that we don't even notice, right? And it's, it's sort of this language of control, the language of management, which understandably so, because we are taught from a very early age that we are responsible for the climate of our relationships, right? We play with, we play with Barbies and dolls and house, and we kind of work on relationship management. So it's understandable then that when we go into marriages and intimate partnerships, we see ourselves as the managers of not just the relationship, but of our partners. And, and it's, you know, the, 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 the self-help industry is a, is an industry of women, you know, I mean, the, the people who buy self-help books are nearly all women. So when men read self-help books, it is very often because they have been handed that book by their partner or their sister or their mom. Oh, and, I have, you know, I have no idea because, what you're talking because about how we right now. <laughs> yeah, I've right. Done, no, I've done that. we've never. <laughs> I've never sent my husband something and just <laughs> suggested he read it. No. So, and it makes sense, right? It's, it's not how we socialize. I mean, boys and men are socialized to have two feelings, like happy or angry. Like we don't, we don't, we don't support, you know, by the age of three, we are touching our little boys less than we're touching our little girls. We talk to our little boys less. So there's ways in which we all, we all, all create these conditions. It's not, it's a problem far too big for blame. So I think that so to go, it's a long way of getting into your question, which I, I think it needs to be an invitation. It needs to be, I love you. I love us. I'm excited about what's possible. Would you consider listening to this episode? Would you consider watching this with me? Would you consider taking this course? Like I would love, so it's so an invitation. I think the, the ask matters so much, right? When we ask from a place of, I'm celebratory about what we have and I'm excited. I want more, you know, versus like, you aren't doing this. You should do this. Other husbands are doing this after all I've done for you. The least you could do for me is, you know, so there's, so that's part of it. And that's not, you know, I think sometimes we get resistant to that idea that we are responsible for how we ask because it feels like another, feels right. like another way to, you know, sort of subtly blame women for what's going on in the relationship. And I think there's something about like just accepting and understanding how I think men are so prone. My experience with men after 20 plus years of doing therapy is men are so prone to defensiveness. They're so prone. They they're so men to husbands, boyfriends tend to be so exquisitely sensitive to how they are being perceived by their female partners that sense that I am a disappointment to her is so exquisitely painful that it creates shutdown or panic or defensiveness because it hurts men so badly to feel like they are a disappointment. Right. So I think that's the part that we, that's the part that's so easy to miss. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's why it needs to be an invitation. Like I, you know, I would love for what I, what I love what you're saying too, is the energy behind the invitation, because I like to talk a lot about the law of energy, not necessarily the law of attraction is the energy that you put out is most likely the energy you're going to get back. So I think it's great that you are coming at it from a celebratory, you know, from mm -hmm. wanting the relationship and seeing the good side of the relationship. So taking a little bit of a turn here, um, a good friend of mine, Marion Stewart, she has done a survey of midlife women, and she found that 70% of the women she surveyed felt switched off from the waist down. <laughs> so <laughs> how much, what percent, 20, 70, 70% oh, yeah. of mm -hmm. the women felt switched off from the, from the waist down. And you have, mm -hmm. you know, your book, taking your sexy back. How do we get our sexy back? Mm -hmm. Well, this, um, let's see, this is a, it's a big question and it's a really important question and her numbers, you know, don't surprise me at all. The place, I guess I would want, the, I guess the, the most important thing to say 
is that we have there's so many ways that we have been sold a bill of goods about sexuality, right? We're sold all these myths about how our sexuality should be, which is which is exactly why I wrote the book, Taking Sexy Back. It's a Taking Sexy Back is a journey for for a woman, for a vulva bodied person, for somebody who's been socialized in the feminine, for her to understand her relationship with her sexuality. And we do that all different kinds of ways. It's a thoughtful and quiet and gentle journey through that whole interior of one's sexuality. But but one of the bills of bills of goods that we've been sold is that sexual desire equals being horny and being ready and being interested and good to go at any moment. And some of us have memories of being like that when we were in our 20s or when we were new in a relationship. Right? Some of us have memories of, of that robust kind of easily easy to access erotic desire. But what happens oftentimes in midlife, oftentimes in the context of a sexually monogamous long-term partnership is that spontaneous desire moves into what we call responsive desire, which is, it's not, I don't feel horny, but if the context is right, then my sexuality, my sexual desire can be cued and brought forward. And then it's like, oh yeah, I do like sex. Sex does feel good. This would feel nice. So sometimes it's, sometimes it is just that a woman is miscoding what's happening inside of herself because she doesn't feel horny. She thinks I'm dead from the waist down, but in reality, if she can work with kind of like what Emily Nagoski calls the accelerators and the brakes, like what are the things that I can do, my partner can do to help me remember that I actually do enjoy sexual experiences and an orgasm really would feel good right now. That's one part of it. The other part of it, and then I, I want to toss it back to you. The other part of it is sometimes we feel dead from the waist down because the sex we're having isn't particularly rewarding sex. So the other bill of goods that especially heterosexual people have been sold is that everything you do before a penis goes into a vagina is foreplay. And everything you do before is just to get the parts ready for the big act, the official act, which is penetrative sex. That's a bill of goods because the research has shown that everything we call quote unquote foreplay is the stuff that's most likely to create an orgasm for a woman, for a vulva bodied person. So why have we relegated that stuff to like the appetizer when that's the most orgasm producing stuff? So if that's the kind of sex she's having where it's like that part is rushed and that part is like a means to an end. And then everyone's focused on the penetrative sex and we got to have an orgasm at the same time and da, da, da. If that's what the script is, no wonder she's dead from the waist down because that's not particularly fun. That, that might be the kind of sexual script that's going to leave her feeling like, wow, I could have, I could have, you know, I could have watched a show. It would have been more fun than that. <laughs> so, so I really like, there's such an app. And I think oftentimes, sadly, it is in midlife that women can start to get curious about actually, hold on a minute. I deserve sex that feels really good to me. And sometimes just to step away from her partner and do some self-exploration, like explore masturbation, get a really amazing toy. There's, we live in a time now where we have sex toy companies. One that comes to mind is Dame Products, where they make toys by women for women that are based on the kinds of sensations that create orgasms for women. And she may need to have a chapter where she is just exploring her own body for a while before she can go back to her partner and be like, okay, my love, we got to <laughs> burn this shit to the ground and we got to create some new menus and new scripts that really center me and my pleasure. So those are a couple of thoughts I have right off the bat around why so many of us feel dead from the waist down. And it's funny because the conversation that when you go back to your partner and say, we need to, to go back to the drawing board, usually when it comes to sex, they won't mind going back to that drawing board. No, no. <laughs> that's like, okay, you want me to be your sex slave? Like lay it on me. What do you want? Like, and that's a beautiful thing. I think oftentimes mid, midlife men are experiencing that 
like deep sense of, I don't have anything to prove anymore, right? Like I don't have to hustle anymore to prove myself. So I can just like, let me just be present to you. And that's a beautiful, like that's, I think there's so much focus on, you know, around sex. There's so much focus for men around getting hard and staying hard and don't come too soon and don't take too long and don't lose it. But there, part of that burning it down can be, listen, babe, actually what's happening with your penis doesn't really matter so much. Like let's focus on me and we don't have to focus on getting you hard and keeping you hard and all of, because actually what's going to create an orgasm inside of me is you using your hands and you using your mouth and you know us like be just being together in a different kind of a way so so that deconstruction and rebuilding can also be really beneficial to men who then get the privilege and gift of experiencing their whole body as a, a pleasure center and a pleasure provider and that can absolutely change your relationship big time so oh yes Right. We, we started this, this interview about being self-aware and one of the things that can be trying for people is self-love. We are our worst critics. We are so hard on ourselves. How can we begin to accept ourselves a little bit more? That's a great question. You've got great questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really happy you're here. And you know, I have more and I know we need to, to, don't worry, I'm going to be asking you back. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> How do we practice self-love? I think, think that it is, you know, one thing I think is incredibly helpful is developing a feminist conscience, like really starting to look at, because, because so much of the self-hating, self-loathing, you're not enough as you are messages are ones that our culture has sold us because entire economies rest on selling us the message that we need this product or this, you know, routine or this, um, whatever piece of clothing in order to be enough. So that feminist conscience, like looking at who benefits from my insecurity right now? Who benefits from me believing this message that these wrinkles are ugly or this curve is disgusting or, you know, this income level isn't enough? What, who benefits from that message, right? So that's part of it is that like getting, getting a bit critical of the, the cultural messaging is part of it. And I, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a practice. It's a, it's um, a daily, like hourly practice of noticing how we're talking to ourselves. I think that part matters. And um, maybe the last thing I would say is building in, like, building in movement, and not it's not like movement, like exercise to check that thing off, but movement because sometimes the self hating messages come from a place of like, we're frozen, we're stuck, we haven't moved, we haven't like moved our bodies to music or, you know, kind of like stepped away from productivity into moving just for pleasure and restoration. And sometimes it's that like just, it's just doing, right? It's doing a beautiful yoga class or, you know, heading out for a walk that then just stops the chatter because the chatter is that like frozen, stuck, repetitive over and over again that we have to kind of break. Well, this has been so much fun and I, there is more I would like to talk to you about. So I'm definitely going to ask you to come back on uh, in the future, but how can people get uh, in touch with you? The best way is, is my website. So dralexandrasolomon.com and there you'll find links to social media. You'll find links to my courses and a, a blog of tons and tons of articles. And then of course, links to the podcast. So that's, that's the, that's the portal, dralexandrasolomon.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for Dr. Alexander for being on the new mid. Thanks, Michelle. Great to be with you.